The Weekly Harvest, an in-depth look at the Brandon Weekings and the WHL. Washman trying to come up with it for Allison. Here's Allison right in front. He scores! Brandon Junior Hockey fans, you've waited two decades for this. In the league's 50th anniversary, your Wheat Kings are the champions. Well, good week once again. Welcome to episode 44 of the Weekly Harvest Podcast, brought to you by Coors Light, the official beer of the Brandon Wheat Kings. My name is Chris Falco. He's Brandon Crow. Crow, how you doing, bud? Oh, I'm great, man. I, I'll tell you, I've never felt better. You know, I, I think about what we've been through in the last year to get to this point where we're, you know, we're less than 10 days away from getting training camp going. And, oh man, it's just a, it's a great feeling. It, to me, it feels like August right now. It's a beautiful day out. The snow's melting. And, uh, and here we are, we're, we're on the verge of training camp for an abbreviated season. So, uh, couldn't be any better. How about you? What's going on in your, uh, your world? Well, you know what? It's like plus four degrees. So I thought I was going to feel the summertime and, and then pull out a nice summer feel shirt. Going to kind of get get the warm thoughts thinking because, yeah, it's it was so beautiful after how frigidly cold it was. I uh, took advantage this weekend. I uh, got to go out, hit the lake again. I uh, got to do some more fishing. Uh, but realistically, a lot of the time, even when I'm sitting at home, I, I'm thinking about the countdown now. Uh, you're right. It feels like it's August. And, no, you know, when you work in hockey – when you get to the start of the season, it's not like it's just another big game. The entire season is ready to go, of course, by that point. So the amount of work that goes into that pre-game one is like three quarters of, of, of your job, and then the rest of it is just kind of following it through. Uh, so yeah, a lot of restless nights I've started to actually have. I don't know, I don't know if you get these as a broadcaster. I get these uh, nightmares as uh, you know, doing what I do, where everything's going wrong. There's no scripts. There's no <laughs> fans. People have moved stuff in the arena. Um, something's preventing me from getting up to the booth to do what I need to do. And it's just, there's always something. I know we're getting close when that happens. Uh, even though we're not even playing in our arena this year, I'm still starting to get those those nightmares. I've had a couple in the last couple of weeks. So that's how I know that we're getting close to, to real hockey being back. And this, that's, that's exactly how I feel. And mine is maybe less when I'm sleeping and more like during the day where I all of a sudden just out of nowhere realize that I've got like 450 things to do. And then I panic. Like today, I, I got home from my oil field job this morning, probably around noonish because it was so warm. So I got home early. I pulled out my computer, my notepad, and I just started getting down to business, started working on all my to-do list, getting things crossed off. Next thing I know, my wife's walking in the door. I've just destroyed the house. There's just stuff everywhere, papers, boxes, <laughs> binders. And like, I've used like four pairs of shoes today, rubber boots, work boots, and sneakers. There's just shit everywhere. And I haven't even considered making supper and I'm actually sitting in the dark because I haven't even turned the lights on yet. So <laughs> I completely got sucked into my weeking work and it, you know what? I don't even feel bad about it because it's been so long. So um, I know how you feel, man. It's it's going to be exciting. And, you know, we've got a lot to cover uh, tonight. We do want to say uh, we got a couple of emails from people and, and people asking us, give us details on the hub. Give us details on the hub. Ross, breakdowns, who's coming, who's coming back, that sort of thing. We can't quite do that yet because we don't have all of the information confirmed from both the league and the team. Soon, but next though. episode. Soon. Yes. Yes. Next week, we will have Darren Ritchie joining us, and it'll be a full training camp preview. We'll break down everybody that's coming, the story for the guys that aren't coming, um, and the story of uh, how everything's shaping up uh, for the actual hockey side. So for you hockey nuts that are really curious, which prospects are coming, how big are they now, how tall are they, who's ready to take that next step, that will be next week. Um, but as for, for tonight, we've kind of just got a little bit of news, and you've got some news uh, at the end of the pod as well about the WHL live stream, which we can talk about uh, once we uh, come back from our interview with Joe Cruz. But uh, as for full hub details, Tune in next week with Darren Ritchie. For tonight, it's all about fun with goaltender Joe Mar Cruz, and we'll get to that uh, in just a bit. But um, I was asking you, before we interviewed Joe Mar, I mean, growing up, of course, him, Jamie Hodson, Jeff McIntosh, Robert McVicker, those were the goalies that I kind of grew up watching. You kind of moved on to Winnipeg, so you weren't really around for that Joe Mar Cruz era. But mm -hmm. when I mentioned Joe Mar Cruz around Brandon and in the office, it's a guy that everybody smiles about thinking about his time in brand. Yeah. I mean, even though you know, I wasn't around Brandon at that time and yeah, I've no 
recollection of Jomar as a weekend at that time. When I started working for the team, uh, it didn't take very long before a couple of those stories, you know, started to pop up, uh, and then very quickly figured out how popular he was when he played here. It was awesome to talk to him. Uh, you know, he's so personable, so outgoing. He was talking in his group chat about other guys who we should have uh, on on the pod saying, you know, oh, this guy would be great. I, I don't know how they could possibly top Jomar. You know, he was one of the best uh, player interviews that I think that we've had in all of the weekly harvest that we've done here so far, for sure. He was just uh, energetic, and I think that's, if you look back at the way he played, I don't think much has changed, even though he's 40 years old now, which he joked about. But uh, yeah, we'll yeah, hear from Joe Mark Cruz in a guy. little bit. But off the top here, we've got to get into news and notes, because there is, I mean, we yeah. so we say you no know, next week, yeah, there's a lot to go through with Darren Ritchie about the Brandon Wheat Kings, but across the league, Crow, there's a lot of things happening right now. And off the top, news and notes, a very familiar name who has helped but really mold and shape who the Moose Jaw Warriors are is moving on from the team it was just announced yeah and uh before we get too far we can't forget to mention our sponsor coors light the official beer of the brandon wheat kings and of course coors light probably be the official beer uh post hub life for the coaching staff because it's going to be a a long uh, eight weeks inside that hub Uh, they'll be pining for a nice silver bullet when it's all said and done but one guy that's not going in the hub as you mentioned alan miller the gm of the moose jaw warriors stepping down today because he's getting a bit of a promotion. He's going as uh, going to Hockey Canada as their new director of player personnel. So after 10 years with the Moose Jaw Warriors, uh, two division titles uh, in 2012 and 2018, the league's most points in 2017 and 2018, uh, he moves on from Moose Jaw as the longest-serving general manager. Um, of course, uh, with Hockey Canada, he got that silver medal this year in Edmonton, a couple of Ivan Halenka golds and silvers. Uh, so moving on to Hockey Canada, it's been a lot of change in Moose Jaw. Of course, Tim Hunter uh, last year uh, giving way to Marco Leary. Uh, they added a female assistant coach in Olivia Howe, and now they're on the search for a new GM. So that, to me, was surprising news today, uh, just as close as we are to training camp and, and how big of a part it's been for him, I'm assuming, planning to get this Moose Jaw team ready to go. Yeah, I mean, the timing for Moose Jaw is probably not ideal uh, with the amount of moving parts uh, heading into this season. At the same time, this is one of those opportunities that, you know, who who knows how it came up. And when it does, that's not just something that a guy like that can pass up, especially with the Olympics on the horizon. And, uh, you know, we don't know exactly what this will entail, but I'm assuming it's something to do along the lines with that as well. Um, You might think it's it's a lock if it wasn't already that Brayden Point's going to be on that uh, Team Canada team or maybe some, uh, some other guys that he's familiar with. But yeah, I, it was uh, it was very surprising for sure um, that the news came out. But congratulations to Ella Miller. That's it's it's, it's a fantastic move, uh, and there's one of the more well respected names in uh, the you know junior hockey, but in the WHL, it's him. So glad to see that that uh, he got the call for Hockey Canada. One of my favorite Alan Miller moments uh, was from a game. I can't remember who they were playing. Might have even been Manon, or I can't remember. But anyway, on the on the online score sheet, when you look, it said Moose Jaw Warriors Alan Miller ejected from game on the online score sheet. And I thought, well, that's got to be a mistake. Why Why was he ejected from the game? Well, I guess he was quite upset with the officiating and he went from his spot in the press box down to the ref room, opened the door and gave them all a piece of his mind in the middle of the game. <laughs> he was ejected from the game and I believe he was fined and suspended after that. But you love a passionate guy like that. Of course, he, along with Grant Armstrong, orchestrated that trade, uh, the Kale Clegg trade. Uh, that got Luca Burzan back into Brandon. And of course, that continues to pay off uh, for the Wheat Kings. So uh, speaking of Luca Burzan, there's a lot of questions about who's coming back, who's not, who's staying in the American League, who's not. Um, a couple of teams in the East Division got significantly better today. Uh, Peyton Krebs uh, getting sent back to Winnipeg from the Henderson Silver Knights. Uh, Ozzy Weisblatt getting sent back to the Prince Albert Raiders from the San Jose Sharks. And Tristan Robbins getting sent back to Saskatoon from the San Jose Sharks as well. So, of course, uh, with Braden Schneider coming back from New York, those are kind of the big guns uh, of the youthful players that are on their way back. Uh, As for uh, Ridley Gregg, he hasn't officially been assigned yet, but because he's in Canada, he doesn't have to quarantine. So they can keep him in Belleville basically right up until Brandon's training camp opens up. So uh, because he's being tested and he's in a controlled environment there, he can kind of just jump right into Regina without the break. Meanwhile, Schneider has to take that break coming back into Canada. So, And uh, and the way Ridley's playing, they'll want him (laughs) to stay with them for as long as possible. So understandable. 
considering he had obviously that health scare with the, the COVID and, and getting back uh, full full lung and full health, he's uh, he's had a great start in Belleville. Cole Reinhardt's had a great start as well. Those are the two question marks for Brandon. Cole Reinhardt in Belleville and Luca Berzen with the Colorado Eagles. Uh, are they coming back? Are they not? We don't know. They are eligible to play in the American League full-time because they're in their 20-year-old season. Um, and with the way the American League is set up right now, the quarantining, the travel, it just it seems like these teams are going younger. You see the taxi squads in the NHL. It's full of young guys, lots of NHL debuts this year. So um, that's one we're going to have to wait. We're going to have to pitch that to Darren Ritchie at next episode to find out if those guys are coming back or not. But uh, some big boosts for Saskatoon, Prince Albert, and Winnipeg this week. So, uh, yeah, team's roster is starting to shape up. But how about this? We are now four days away from the Western League starting in the central division. How about that? Is is that surprising to you? Because to me, I kind of forgot all about it. I've been so focused on the East. There's two games Friday night, Lethbridge, Edmonton, Medicine Hat, Red Deer kicking things off. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And you know, they're going to be kicking off. Meanwhile, we're just down the road uh, and you got the BC division, which still has not been granted approval to play. <laughs> so yeah. it's going to be a wild season in the WHL, uh, how this divisions, uh, how it's all going to work out in the end. Uh, but yeah, just literally days away from the central getting started. And uh, you know, a, 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 there's a little bit of jealousy in, in play here when, you know, I see the social media posts of them getting to be in their home arenas and having the players around and and doing that but uh from the straight up logistics of what they're having to 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 to, to go through um it's kind of nice to actually watch it from afar so hoping for all the best i hope that they can you know obviously pull this off successfully um but uh especially for the first few weeks i think it's going to be a major test that uh, the whole rest of us are really going to have to pay attention to to follow yeah, that's the thing. It's it's one of those. It's kind of a double edged. No, not double edged sword. What am I looking at? It's what, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's it's beneficial, I think, for the East Division teams to watch how this starts in the Central, because now you get a bit of a, a they get a bit of a head start. So the Eastern Division teams can kind of watch this a little bit, see what works, see what doesn't. They're, the equipment managers are going to be sharing ideas. The the athletic therapists will be sharing ideas. GMs, radio guys. It's uh, from an East Division standpoint, it's not bad to be coming, uh, you know, maybe a week, 10 days behind because there could be some things that come up in the Central Division that we go, hey, wow, did not think of that. Totally. And uh, it's a good thing that it came up. So, and, um, and, and it's not like it's just, you know, going to be different because we're in a hub city either um, because a lot of the Central teams, like the way that the fans follow their teams now is on social media, on the website, with the video. Uh, a lot of those people aren't going to be traveling with the team doing that from the road. Uh, of course, if all goes well, of course, you're going to be there doing the broadcast of the radio, but from the fans' perspective, everything on the social media, the highlights, uh, everything like that, we're going to be back here in Brandon doing that. Um all the other teams in the East Division, they're going to be back in their home cities as well. Like They're not really going to be having anybody in the hub doing that. So it's going to be all off-site, and the Central's not any different. Like They're only taking, of course, just the essential personnel on the road trips. So from the business side and the... Um, uh, and the and the enter- entertainment side for what we can present to the fans because there are no fans everywhere. This is the perfect chance to us to to watch and just see how they can present these game days um, because ours are going to be very similar just in the fact that it's going to be all online. It's uh, it's going to be neat. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting things going. Uh, and we, of course, will have uh, the full camp breakdown on episode 45 with General Manager Darren Ritchie uh, next week. But, of course, uh, this week, our guest, he was a fan favorite. Uh, he loves the Weekings. He's got uh, two young kids that uh, both of them really want to excel in the hockey world. One wants to play for the Weekings. The other one wants to be a referee in the NHL. So uh, we'll hear all of that. Uh, in our interview with uh, Joe Mark Cruz uh, this week on episode 44, brought to you by Coors Light. Enjoy. Episode 44 of the Weekly Harvest, presented by Coors Light, the official beer of the Brandon Wee Kings. And uh, we're going to go back into the to the late 90s for our guest this week. Uh, and he's a guy that the fans loved him when he was in the crease and probably loved him more when he left his crease. Our guest this week, Joe Mark Cruz. Joe Mark, thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, what are, what have you been up to uh, lately? Where, where are you at right now? Oh, I'm up in the pot where I grew up. So um, I'm here. I work for the town. Uh, I'm a wellness consultant and recreation director. Uh, so I, that's what I've been doing the last seven years now. Seven, eight years, eight years. So you got wellness consultant. So I see on your Instagram, it's lots of fitness related stuff. So kind of just talk us through yeah. your job description. What do you do on a day-to-day my, basis? 
my main, it actually started off as basically I was just a personal trainer. Um, that's what I went to school for. Uh, it's always been a passion of mine. Uh, when I was growing up, obviously, off-season training was a big part of my my deal, and um, you know I, I carried that into into my game. Um, and then while I was playing hockey, I took advantage of the education program, uh, got my university degree uh, in exercise sports science over the years, and um, and now I'm a certified personal trainer through the Canadian Society of Exercise Physiology, uh, and. That's what my basically about 90% of my job is uh, for the last seven years. I just took on another role as recreation director here. So uh, on top of the wellness consultant now, um, I'm also the recreation director. So that involves a lot more admin work. But for the most part, uh, about yeah, 80, 90% of my day is personal training uh, clients in the paw here. <laughs> I know that uh, a little bit later, I want to go into more detail about, about uh, you specifically using the scholarship fund and, and about that. But uh, when's the last time uh, you strapped on the pads and played? Are you still playing senior men's or are you strictly well, playing out of nah. the crease now? Do you play anymore? No, I I, I definitely play. We have a, it's not a league here. We, we don't have enough players to have a league here. We did have one season where we did have a senior team and we did really well. We had a we had an extremely good team that was completely local with other than two players, but the two players that were not local actually lived here uh, for quite a number of years. So um, it was really good, the support we got from the team. But right now um, we just have a group of guys that go out every Wednesday or sorry, every Thursday and Monday. Um, obviously not right now with COVID, but um, I, I strap them on all the time. I know when I did first uh, stop playing hockey uh, when I was 27, 28, I, I, I didn't go in that for a year. And um, that was just to take a break. Um, I like playing out. I always like playing out once in a while. You know, most goalies like putting on the player skates and trying to score goals. Um, it never really happens for me. But, um, you know, you, you try. And it's, it's a whole new game out there for goalies to, to put on the player skates. and try. Like, it's just a different beast. So um, it goes the other way, too. I know when players say they go in the net, it's, it's so different for everyone. So, um, but yeah, no, I do play still. Um, obviously, this year, uh, we didn't get to that much uh i think the last time i was on the ice was october 30th um but yeah i i still love the game i still love playing in fact i think mm, even now i appreciate it more and and playing so whenever i get to do go on the, get to go on the ice I, I really do appreciate it especially when it's at a competitive level you got a couple of young kids so do they like to come out and just you know rip shots at you or maybe you know uh, put you through the paces <laughs> You know what? They're not. They're not quite there yet. And my youngest one is actually a goalie. Um, <laughs> I, we, I try. I, we, my wife and I tried to convince him not to be, just because we knew how hard. It, and and the, actually, his personality. Like, we saw him. Like, he, he has a bit of a temper, um, and he's he's pretty emotional. So we we didn't think it would be the best position for him just because of that. But it's crazy how how well he listens to. Um, instruction and how he understands as a goalie that you can't just uh, let goals get to you. You kind of have to be able to brush it aside and, and just keep playing your game. And um, at eight years old, he understands that. And, you know, I've never really seen him get upset. And it's crazy the things that he can do. I'm like, I'm not even biased, but like, he's definitely a better goalie than I was at that age. And actually, I wasn't even a goalie by eight, but, uh, um, I wasn't doing the things he's doing at eight that at 10 or 11 or 12 even. And um, I, I couldn't even get up with the proper leg when I was 15. I didn't learn it till I was 15. So he's doing, he's well ahead of me right now. So <laughs> whatever, if he's having fun doing it, that's great. Um, we just got off the ice not too long ago before I came on the air here. So um, he has fun with it. And my, old, my, my oldest one, he's a defenseman, but his goal is to be an NHL ref. So since he was six, that's what he said. Um, and the reason being too is he's like, you know what? I'm probably going to make the NHL, but I, I have a better chance doing it as a ref. So he's going to try to do that. <laughs> wow. You don't hear that very often from a kid. That's I know. Awesome. You know what? It, 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 it's, it's awesome. And he said it since he's six and he's still saying it. So um, we support that and we, we'd like to see him try to reach for that goal. So uh, they have backup plans too, which is great. And they're only eight and 10. So <laughs> we, we understand how it is. And, um, I think they, they do a good job of, uh, kind of separating reality and what's realistic for them and they have fun with it still. So that's the main thing. 
And in this day and age, Jomar, with hockey and kids at this age, when 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 they're coming up, it is a completely different landscape to when you were coming up. I remember reading the article a number of years ago that uh, Perry Bergson uh, wrote. Fantastic writer here. Yeah. We're so lucky to have him at the Brandon Sun with his alumni series. And I, I remember uh, in that uh, in that story reading about about you coming up, and it always caught me of not knowing that you got drafted. Just e- e- even that, like not knowing about the process, about what's going on. So kind of take us back to a young teenage Jomar Cruz. You're up in the paw. You're obviously on a, what, like a successful minor hockey system or like how did this even come about in your eyes? Well, you know what? I would say like our, our minor hockey team, like I always remember losing a lot. Like we never won a tournament. We never, our, the, the best I remember ever doing as uh, so the Paw Husky is winning a B-side champion, and that was the greatest thing. We got a trophy. That was probably my first trophy, and I don't even remember what age. I, I might have been in novice, maybe first year Adam, and we got a trophy, and I, we were proud of that. But, like, we didn't win a lot, um, let alone get even get to a final. Uh, and the reason why myself and my goalie partner, for that matter, got noticed is because of the shots, we, the amount of shots we gave up, and we just faced a lot of rubber. Um and I just played. And, you know, I like I said, in that story, I told Perry, I didn't know about the draft. I didn't know about the Wheat Kings, to tell you the truth. Um, I remember the World Juniors. I remember seeing guys like that. And I never knew where they came from. I know, I didn't know that, you know, Eric Lindros came from the Oshawa Generals. I just knew that Eric Lindros was Eric Lindros. And, um, yeah, for me, growing up playing hockey, it was just playing hockey. And there was no really... I want to get to the next level because I really didn't know what the next level was. So uh, it wasn't until maybe uh, before the draft year, obviously we started getting some attention and my coach who I now personal train, um, he's a good friend of mine too. Um, But I I personal train him now. He, uh, he mentioned to us myself and Preston, who is my goalie partner, one of my best friends also growing up we're getting noticed by these scouts and um, I don't know who these scouts are, but they're scouts. One was from the Kamloops Blazers and um, he was a local and um, he was actually from the pod, the, the scout and he, he was noticing us. And then all of a sudden a bunch of other scouts from the Western league were noticing us. And it was just, it was foreign to me. I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. And then even when it came to the draft, like didn't know that everyone knows now, like, players are watching the ticker and they're watching on the internet when they got drafted. And, you know, it just wasn't like that back in the, in the nineties. So what is like your, your first experience that, that you remember coming into Brandon? Um, you know what? The, the first time I remember actually it was watching Jody Lehman play a game in the final. I think it was game one against spoke. And I, I want, I can't remember who the goalie on spoke was, but he was a wrong hat, like he's the wrong handed goalie. Really good. It might've been Boucher. I'm not sure. Um, but both played well. It was a one, nothing game. And, um, that was my first experience. I'm like, Oh, I want to play here. Like, and, and the fans were loud and it was great. Like I, I just remember the biggest thing that stood up, up stood out in that game was, um, the goalies. They were unbelievable. They like one, nothing game, lots of shots, lots of chances. And then obviously, um, I don't know if you noticed, but my pads my first year were exactly like Joey Lehman's his last year here there when when they went to uh, the Memorial Cup. Um, the only difference is was I actually had all gold. He had just a little bit of black in there at the top. And um, yeah, I, that that was my first experience as, a, as experiencing any kind of weekend game. And I was excited. At, well, after that, it was like game over. I like I wanted to play there. So when I look at your stats, obviously in the Brandon Weeking all-time history, you sit uh, 17th in games played uh, for all franchise uh, goaltenders with Brandon. You're about 11 games behind Brian Elder, who was a pretty good goaltender as well. You're actually tied yeah. with Yuri Patera, who just uh, graduated and is now in the American League with Vegas's farm team. But obviously your time in Brandon was uh, stretched over you know parts of three seasons and then a trade. But uh, when you think back to your time in Brandon, yeah. obviously Kelly McCrimmon would have been a, a played a big role but who are some people that you really remember from your time in Brandon oh my coaches for sure Lozy and Johnny um I remember for one I was scared of Lozy uh I think a lot of people were but he was great to me um he just came off as the big rough uh rough coach that maybe um 
yelled a lot or took it out on a lot of guys. But um, he, I, I think he connected with his players at the same time, which made it, you know, uh, that's what made him successful. So, and, and I know he evolved over the years too, and he, he wasn't so hard on guys, but um, th- those two guys were, were really inspirational and um, they affected just the person I am today. And I, I have a lot to say, like a lot of good things that I could say about them. And um, I can't say enough, but um, other, like aside from coaches, um, player wise, you know, one of the biggest guys that helped me a lot that year was Stefan Trineski. He was a fellow Northern boy, but I know he'd grab me to the side. And if I had a bad game, he'd pull me over and just talk to me, just like, you know, just casual talk, just to, to try and bring me up. And um, Darren Van Owen, I remember him doing that after a Tri City game um, that I got pulled in and we ended up winning, actually. So, uh, you know what? I can't say enough about that team. And it's funny that. Uh, you bring that up because all those players, we still talk and we have this chat going on right now. Um, and literally, as we are doing this podcast, these guys are texting. Alex Argirio right now is texting something and I can see it. And uh, Randy Ponte is in it. Like almost my entire team from that first year, we're all in this one chat right now. And uh, over, over COVID, it kind of started, but um, <laughs> it honestly started. This is a good story. It honestly started um, the chat back in, uh, I think it was last season, no, two seasons ago. Uh, and it was ironically Black Awareness Month, which it is right now. And um, the Portland Winterhawks, who I played for in my final season, uh, ended up putting me <laughs> on that on that uh, the advertisement, and and I'm not black, and it, it was funny because I know the guys they, they know that I'm Filipino, and I wasn't in Portland very long, so they they maybe don't know, and and uh, so it started a conversation um, between me, Brad Swartick, Jamie Hodson, who uh, are, are very close and still very close, but um, that chat evolved into the whole team basically now chatting so um we stay connected and uh it's funny like that whole team has affected my life and uh it was a great year chris was gonna bring it up he said to me before he came on he goes hey we were just laughing about this portland thing i don't know if it's too insensitive to bring up should i leave it i'm glad you did (laughs) well no it it, it was well just because you know i no sorry go on go on i i actually the first person i texted was Krim and I sent it to Krim. I was like, Krim, look at this. And then, <laughs> and then Krim's response, his response, was like, well, Pinky won't be too happy about that. She, you're, you guys are Filipino. I'm like, <laughs> you're like, yeah. So, and Pinky's my mom. So, um, both my parents are Filipino. It's just funny because uh, I wasn't in Portland very long, so they wouldn't know. And I'm of color, so it doesn't really matter. But like, it, it's it's awareness. It's just it just it was it was a funny thing that that got brought up, and for sure the guys would have would have teased me about it. So I was the one to bring it up and um, we had a good laugh about it. There is one thing from your uh, short professional career that you will probably never, well, obviously you'll never have to take away from you is the fact that you're the first ever Filipino drafted to the NHL uh, when you were taken in the yeah. draft by Washington. So, I mean, obviously growing up in the Paw, Manitoba, that's you know not necessarily a place really, you know, known to produce no. Filipino hockey players. So what was it like growing up, uh, you know, in that minority in a Northern Manitoba town where they already have their own uh, culture and that sort of thing with that Northern lifestyle? Yeah. You know what? Well, first of all, my, my parents came, the reason why they came down here was my mother uh, it was a nurse and she had just graduated. Um, Canada was short, short on nurses and the Paul was bringing nurses in from everywhere. So that's how they got there. She came on my dad's fall. Um, for me, honestly, most people thought I was native. Um, they thought I was Aboriginal. They they didn't really second guess anything. But um, my parents didn't even want me to play hockey. They didn't let me play hockey at first. Actually, I had to uh, first join figure skating, um, and I started with that. And then I got into can or sorry, actually, I started with can skate, and then I was in figure skating. So I started with those two. They wanted to make sure I can skate first before I even started into hockey. And, and I don't know these days, lots of people they'll throw their kid into hockey first because usually, uh, like here, I know if your first year is free. So um, my parents just wanted to make sure, like, if you can skate, then you can start playing hockey. Um, I think right. they just didn't want to give, yeah. So it wasn't really out of the norm for me like I didn't know any different if it was going to be uh awkward or whatever being Filipino playing hockey but uh, my brother didn't play uh he didn't want to but the odd thing is now as a 
a 45 year old in the last five years, he's picked it up and he plays his wife plays now too, who didn't play with him. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, what? It, it's not common for a Filipino coming from the North to play, but um, also I was, I'm, I'm a tall guy. Like I'm six, two. And for, for uh, yeah, for a Filipino, even to just be at around close to six feet as tall. And I, for some reason I'm six, two, um, how I got there. I have no idea. I know my mom's uh, I think, great grandfather is a lot taller like in the six two six three range so that must be where i'm getting it from but generally filipinos like five 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 four or five three <laughs> so you know who oh, you know the trivia question of who is the second filipino drafted do you know the answer to that is it not jared dumba uh well is it matt or is there one or sorry matt dumba sorry I, matt I'm dumba yeah because jared yeah, Jared's dumba. the one that sorry, played matt, when you played Jerry, yeah, that's what, sorry. Yeah, Matt. Uh, I was thinking Matt Dumb, and then Matt Matt obviously went on to play, right? So yeah, he's still um, with uh, Minnesota. But yeah, I just wasn't sure if he yeah. knew who the second guy was. Yeah, I think he he is like what we call half and half. So um, his I think his mother is of Filipino descent, and I'm not sure where his father's from. But uh, yeah, so both my parents are full blood Filipino. Um, Im- immigrated from the Philippines, uh, and I think that was. Oh, geez, I'm 40. It's a long time ago now. So, uh, <laughs> you yeah, may be a Jeopardy so, question someday. That's that's someday, a yeah. serious random yeah. trivia question for sure. Yeah, it would have been back in my day. It would have been one of the Robin's Donuts and Deli questions, but now, now I don't know if they still do that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Alex Argirio, if you ever get him on the po- like, he will be by far your ever your best bo- podcast for sure. Like, he'll crack the jokes and he can rattle off everything Rick Dillabo says. He he can spout that off on the. Yeah, he, <laughs> you got to get him on there. If you haven't got him on yet, you got to get Alex on here. We've been, we've been, we, we've actually been trying to get uh, Rick Dillavo on the podcast for a while. I've been bugging Dilly. He of well, course you, would not yeah, come you, on. He he won't. He really? won't. Yeah. yeah, he won't. Yeah. You should get get Dilly on at the same time as the Greek. That would be great. <laughs> Now there's you, like a, you, there's like this famous uh, like inside video. I don't know if that's him or not, but was that him who did like the Rick imp- like the Rick Dillabo impersonation? <laughs> yeah, for sure it must be. I haven't seen it yet, but I've seen it live, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> he does it all the time. He does it all the time. Yeah, whenever we get together, like oh, he's got to be the funniest week king in history. For sure. <laughs> well, while we've got, while we're on the 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 light and fun train, I'm going to share my screen because this does get shown uh, on um, <laughs> on the uh, WCG TV for viewers that want to watch. So we're going to pull this up and we're going to watch this. Uh, okay. For those of you that are just listening, uh, you'll hear Bruce Lubke and Dean Jago in the background. Uh, these are both of Joe Mark Cruz's Western Hockey League fights against Evan Lindsay and Matt Cockle, and then we'll break it down after. Cruz and Lindsay saw his one another up, and Cruz some straight right hands on Evan Lindsay right out there at center ice, gets him down, and he keeps going away at the Raider goaltender. Reuters is throwing with Proto right out at center ice. It's funny because we were talking about this in the chat not too long ago. Boy, that's some quality uh, camera work there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's Ronnie so Popplestone in the Evan background Lindsay too. Eh? Leakin. Who was that in the background yeah. you said there, Jomar? That was Ron Popplestone. And I think Ron Popplestone and Lou. Fast hair. Yeah. It finishes with this brawl. Yeah. And then the video transitions into a replay of you beating up Evan Lindsay. <laughs> and then we just skip ahead to the Matt Cockle, uh, which Chris has a great story about after. And we'll get, we'll tell. Oh. Okay, so here now we got you and Matt Cockle at center ice while there's a whole yeah. brouhaha going on in the corner. And this was a long one. <laughs> Look <Yeah>. at that. <laughs> Jersey and <you> know. <laughs> All right, so now that we've seen those, and you've yeah. probably watched those, I'm sure your kids have seen them. My kids what have seen it. What do you remember yeah. from every, your fights? Every little, de- every detail, every detail. Yeah, I'm so, just going to close well, out this so start, I can hear you but, again. Yeah, there we go. I'll start with the Evan Lindsay one. So the game seven two. I don't know how much time's left. I think there's about uh, there's probably about 13 minutes left in the third still. Um, at least at least 10. Anyways, uh, irregardless. So we're winning seven two. We're we're pumping them and Randy Ponte lays a hit on someone by their bench. And then the guy retaliates on Ponte 
and Plante, they, they start swinging. And then guys are grabbing him from the bench. So Plante starts swinging at the bench too. So you don't see that on the video because the camera work isn't the greatest. It's, it's falling to play still. But the guys that were on the ice there, so it's Randy Plante, Andre Lupandin, who is actually a decent fighter, um, Josh Voidis, my, obviously myself, Ryan Robson, and I'm missing someone. Um, unless we were on the PK, but I don't remember that. I want to say Jonathan Aiken, actually. Um, I don't know who Aiken ended up with, but um, I know, I know, <laughs> I don't know if that video shows it, but if you actually go to the video in the archive, Robson has a tough time with who he's with. I think it's Paget and Lupandin. I don't remember who he's with, but he gets jumped too, and he's he has a tough time uh, with his his opponent. So um, I remember looking at the bench right away, like when it's all when everyone started going, I was like, oh, and I looked at the bench and Lowe's, he's like go and i i was just waiting for that so um because Lindsay's he's at the end he's pissed he he got punched for seven already and he's slabbing his stick and he wants to go and he's already at the blue line pretty much and yeah i, I looked to Lozy and Lozy's like you can go yeah <laughs> he gives me the nod so i i rip i take my time though like i don't i didn't rip out there because I just wanted to make sure that I was ready to go. And um, I strap on my, at the time, I, I used to strap on my glove really tight. So I had to get it off. Um, so I take that off and and we meet at center ice. And I don't know if he knew, but like my arms, I have long arms. And, you know, going into that, like, I, yeah, I, like I, maybe he does, but like, you know, I look at guys like Ryan Reeves, they have long arms and guys just don't understand like how, how much of an advantage that is. And I'm, I'm no stranger to practicing fighting because I credit it to my time in Notre Dame because we always used to play fight all the time. Never, not just on the ice, but like all the time in the dorms, we'd be doing it. And it was just a thing we do. Like um, my roommate there was Vinny Letelier. He was always doing it with Brad Richards. And like guys were just always doing stuff like that in, in Notre Dame and <laughs> I honestly, that it actually helped, but, um, it was my, it wasn't my first fight that year. So the, the fight with Evan Lindsay, that was my second fight. My first fight was at camp in, in OCN, um, with a friend of mine who obviously a, a goalie too, but, um, we had fought in camp and I had done well in that, that one as well. So, um, I remember going up to Lindsay and, you know, right away when we grabbed on, I knew I had a reach advantage and, um, I just threw and made sure that I, he had stayed at arm's length and um, he popped me with a few shorties and uh, I honestly don't didn't feel them at the time but you know, I knew after the fight I, I had I'd taken a few to the to the face but um, I, I knew I'd got him good with my left with a short one and that's what what broke his nose. Um, the funny thing about that fight is it was right before World Juniors, so I actually felt bad about this because he was going to World Juniors before, right after, like that weekend. And and then when I saw him on TV when he got released from World Juniors, his nose was like taped down and because it was broken. Um, so I actually felt bad about that. So um, th- that's a little side note that probably not a lot of people knew, um, but that was the reason why he had, his nose was all taped up in the in the release when he got let go from World Juniors. Um, with the Matt Cockle one, um, <laughs> we were winning 3 nothing, and there's like only a minute left. And Alex Argirio hits Barrett Jackman uh, around the half wall in the offensive zone. And for some reason, it must have been a good hit, but like, you know, the Greek, he does not like lay big hits and it's Barrett Jackman, so he shouldn't have crushed him. But for some reason, there's a fight there and he's got Barrett Jackman. <laughs> and then everyone else is in. So I'm thinking because it's Barrett Jackman, everyone else is in. Um, I don't remember everyone on the ice there, but Cockle, he was already at center ice waiting for me, um, calling me on. And I looked to Lozy again. He says, go. And I, this time, I take my sweet time. Like I turn around. And I undo my my gloves and my blocker. I place it nicely on the net. Like I don't even like throw shed it and just throw it on the ice. I I took my time. So and the reason why I took my time is because I I wanted all the fights to be over, um, so we don't get in the way. Last time I remember b- bumping into someone after the fight, and I just didn't want it, that to happen again. So I took my time. By the, by the time we were going, it was just me and Cuckle. Everyone else was done. So um, he popped me good. The first, like right when we got centered and usually I don't come in flying and I came in a little faster. Uh, usually I just let them come to me because 
that's how I do it. And this time I was a little bit rambunctious and we both came in and we both hit, um, but he hit me good. And I, if you see in the video, I stepped back and I almost fall, but I catch myself. And then I came back and after that it was done be pretty much because I got him. And then he grabbed on and when he, as soon as he grabs onto me, I knew I was grabbing him. I was going to yank him down. He yanked and then I pulled his jersey over and then I kept going. Um, and that's like, that's a move that I always learned in Notre Dame. We'd always do that. We'd yank down so that we could pull the jersey over. Um, and I knew he wouldn't be had his tie down on. And if he did, he was going to, it was going to be even worse probably because it would just be stuck. It wouldn't get over. But uh, yeah, that, that, that one, I didn't even think twice though about giving up the shutout. And the funny thing is after that, Hodgson came in, recorded the shutout. So we share that shutout. So there's an asterisk by that shutout because he played a minute 13 or something and got the shutout too with me, but he gets a shut, he gets credit for a full shutout. And so did I, which is really weird. You don't see that very often. Right. So, um, and in that game, you know, this is the funnier part is there was almost another line brawl with about just under a minute left. And Hodson was going after Todd for dork. <laughs> So and we we know Todd Fedorik is like he's a tough guy, legitimate is, NHL yeah. guy. Yes. Yeah. And and he's going like something happened. Like they they kind of I think they someone slew footed him, and I think it was Fedorik. And so he went after <laughs> he went after him, and there was almost another one. So if he would have fought, we probably would have seen Brad Fedorik in the net. <laughs> well, Chris, Chris was telling me before about a great moment with Matt Cockle like 25 years later. Well, yeah. So like one of uh, about six years ago or so when I, when I first started with the team, um, there was this moment where like Matt was our goaltending coach yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know, like after, a, a, after wins, not after losses, but after wins, we would go into the, like, you know, through the marketing guys, uh, we would go into the coach's office with them and, you know, yeah. just talk about the game. How's it going? Sit around, um, have a drink or two. And, uh, something was happening on the TV and they were talking about goalie fights. So everybody's going around and talking about their goalie fights. And, and just, I, I think I think me or somebody else asked, you know, Krim, what's, you know, one of your favorite Wheat King goalie fight memories? And then he was telling this story. He's like, uh, I remember Joe Mar Cruz, you know, turning around, placing his gloves on and then going and then just feeding this Regina goalie. And then somebody else tripped in and was like, oh yeah, that was, I remember that. So who was that? Who had they kept, kept going? Anyway, eventually it gets around to Matt about five minutes later and they go, Matt, you were a goalie. Were you ever in a fight? He goes, uh, yeah. Yeah, I uh, I fought Joe Mar Cruz, <laughs> and the whole room just like starts dying laughing. Like, oh Grim my knew. god, he was just waiting for him to say it for sure. For um, sure, he that, knew. For yeah. sure, he did. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, he did not remember who it was. He knew exactly who it was, <laughs> but he did I, not say it and let it get to him. Yeah, yeah. When when they when they hired Matt on, I I, I texted him. That was funny actually. I, I I sent him a message about that, and I was like, oh, you guys are gonna rip him for sure about that. So. uh yeah, no, that's funny that that happened. I've heard that story too before. <laughs> so did your, have your kids watched that? Like, I know I asked Aaron Rome if his kids had watched his old fight videos or, you know, his dangerous hit on Nathan Horton. And he said, ah, they're kids. They're going to find whatever they want on YouTube, but I'm not showing it to them. Have they found it yet? Or are they still yeah. too young? Well, the, no, they, they found it. They, they didn't, they didn't find it. Some other kids found it for them. Um, so <laughs> my picture hangs in our local rink and I, when people ask if that's me, I'm in my weekend uniform. It's a picture from my third year there. Um, and I was, no, that's not me. And, and then, and then one kid like Googled it and whatever and found the fight and then said, this is your dad. And so that's how they saw it. Um, so yeah, they, they've seen the fight. They've seen both fights for sure. Yeah. Were they, yeah. were they, they surprised? Uh, and then I, they-, like, they asked questions and like, Oh, why'd you guys fight? He's like, well, like why it was happening, like why, what, why were we fighting? And I said to them, like, well, to be honest, it, it was, it was a line brawl, and um, I didn't actually start it, but it started with one of our players fighting, and then everyone else started fighting, and then the other goalie called me. And one of the rules I always had, uh, my rule for myself is that if the other goalie wanted to fight, he was going to have to start it. He was going to have to call me on. Like I was never going to, hey, cockle, let's go, um, just for no reason. Um, the only way I would be jumping in on something is if like it's a power play situation for the other team and it's a fun. Yeah. And we're in our end and there's a scrum. I'm grabbing them for sure. hundred percent. And then if they want to start something for sure, it's, it's, it's go like whether it's a player or a goalie. Um, it happened in, in senior hockey where the guys we, we were, it was, I think it was a five on three actually. And, and they were all in. And so I grabbed the guy, actually I ended up with two guys 
Um, and what, and then the goalie tried to come down. Um, but one of the, uh, or one of our, our players said, no, don't, don't do it. And, um, their other, their team told them not to go in either. Cause it was already a five on three for them, but nothing really happened. I didn't fight, but I'm always, I'm always there to, <laughs> to jump in if, if I have to. Uh, uh, I, I think fair. it's, you know, it's it, getting outnumbered. <laughs> It comes with being, I think there's something about it because they they joke about, it's something about, there's something in the water about being north of a certain latitude on the map where it's just <laughs> yeah. like, it's just in your blood. Like obviously you got Jordan Tutu, you know, we talk about Braden Schneider from Prince Albert, which isn't even that far north, but he's got that right. Prince Albert toughness to him. And it's just something about it. I mean, uh, yeah. Scott, Scott Halady, our equipment manager, you might know Scooter yeah. from in the past. 100% do. Uh, he says when he went down to play pro in the, I don't even know what it was, the United League or the International League at one point, he kind of s- described it similar to Slapshot. And I know that the SPHL and the East Coast League in those days was maybe described like that as well. Is that the experience you had when you went down south as well, a little bit like something out of Slapshot? Uh, yeah, you know what? The fighting, it wasn't, there wasn't a lot of fighting. There was fighting. It was, it was, I would say it's like junior. It, like, I, I would say it was like the Western League back in that day, like as far as the fighting goes. Um, you know, the fighting's a lot different now. I, it doesn't happen as often. It's usually because of a big hit that's clean. Um, now, uh, yeah, I don't think it's the same this, the way it is in the SPHL now, but uh, I really can't say. But I know when I was playing and, and even in the East Coast, it just seemed similar. Everything, everything seemed kind of similar to what the Western League was and what I experienced for, as, for the amount of fights or why fights were going down. Um, but yeah, uh, I know Scooter and he, he, he's a pretty tough character too. I've never, I've, I've, ne- I've not experienced it fighting him, but, uh, um, he, he's been good to me. He, uh, he played with me senior hockey. Uh, we were making a run for, uh, senior the one year. Oh, geez. I, I'm that old that I can't remember, but, um, I do know Scooter. Well, that was with Ilda. Sh- was that with Ilda Shane for the Allen? Yeah, Cup? that that's yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, um, there's a few years, and Hodge Hodge did the same thing too with them um, one year. They actually went to the Allen Cup with them, so uh, it, it was a good experience. It was tough because I'm traveling all the way from north to play with them, and that made it pretty hard. But um, it's always competitive, and and for me, that's what I like about the game is is when it gets competitive. <laughs> One Chris, thing you got I any wanted, more in the bag? yeah, yeah. There was one thing I wanted to to, to touch more on, which I kind of alluded to earlier. Uh, like one of my roles at Jomar is when we when we can go out in the community is to take the players to the schools. Uh, we do like the TD Read to Succeed, very popular program. Talk about the importance of education. Yeah. And one thing they always talk about, of course, is the WHL scholarship. About you know there there's guys who and your life is kind of the, this this story. You come up through junior. You get even selected by pro. A lot of guys don't even get to get as far as you do after that, and they go directly on to use their scholarship. But just how important was that, having that available for you, that you could go to the U of M and do what you did there? Yeah, that's huge. Um, I, I, like I tell my kids, I said, if, if anything, you're going to use hockey to get your education. Um, that's the best thing you can do probably for your parents. And, um, you know, that's what that was my plan. Um, I always wanted to be able to, find, find a way to pay for my own education and, and take advantage of that. And I, I certainly was able to do that. Um, going to school at Brandon university, actually in Portland as well. Um, the, the only place I didn't go to was in try. I didn't take advantage of there, but I, I would always actually take summer classes instead, uh, and utilize it that way. Um, uh, the only reason I didn't do it in try was because it just didn't work out as transferring uh, certain certain courses back to, to Canada, where at Portland State University, I was able to transfer a lot of those courses over here. Um, but you know what? It, it's huge. Um, and you mentioned the Read to Succeed program, and, and that was something that myself and actually Brad Swardick and Brett Gerard did in our first year. Uh, we, we were in heavily involved in that, and that was something I enjoyed doing a lot, um, going to visit the schools and, and talking about education and and, the, and that program um, that it's not just all about hockey and uh, even even going into my my last year to sign uh, with Washington uh, one of the biggest things that was on the table is that and it's not a huge deal but like and no one probably even thinks about this now is that you can get an education clause in an NHL contract that makes sure that the team pays for your education like it seems silly but like why not? You know, it's, it's education. And, um, it's something I wanted part of my contract when I was uh, doing those negotiations, but for sure, education, um, 
huge part of my life, uh, that, that program. And it's obviously still going today. And I've seen a lot of guys take advantage of it. Um, I know I could have just stayed and, and played pro longer, uh, right after my 21, 20 year old year. Um, but you know, in that case, you end up losing your scholarship if you play too long and you also have to sit out so many years of CIS at the time it would have been CIS. It's now U sport, but you'd have to sit out so long before you can start playing again. And I didn't want to miss out on those years. I wanted to get going and, um, I wanted to get my degree faster anyway. So, uh, and then, and then go play pro. Like it's always going to be there. The, you know, those leagues are always going to be there. So, uh, there's, there was really no rush for me to get there. I just wanted to make sure that I, I was taking care of my, my fallback for myself. Well, we always like to finish our interviews with a little rapid fire, just some quick questions, just find out what's going on in your life or what you're interested in that sort what you're interested in and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm a big collector. I, I love collecting jerseys and uh, all sorts of different things. Uh, if, if you had to leave your house right now and could grab one piece of memorabilia from your whole career, what would you grab and why? Oh, geez. Um, probably my Jersey. Uh, I just have my one Jersey and actually one guy uh, that is a collector, he's a big Patera fan, is sending me my white jersey right now. So I, I probably just got my jersey. That's probably my most valuable. Uh, like it's from my rookie year. Um, and, and, and that was by far my favorite year because we went to the final. What a, a great team um, and a very memorable year for me for that year. So probably that one. I, j- I just got a little bit distracted there when you, when you, when you talked about big collector. His his first name would be Adrian, would it? Uh, it's I think it's Peter actually. He uh, okay, okay. he has like every every like he's got Patera's gear. He's got his jerseys. Um, he's got everything. Like he's got more than one set of Patera stuff too. Like uh, I actually helped him get it and some of the stuff. And um, so as a favor, he just sent me my jersey. So oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, awesome for me. Um, awesome for him. He's, he's a great guy. Uh, I, I just happened to meet him because he said, Hey, I have your Jersey and we got to talking and I said, Oh, I could probably help you out and make, see if I can get a Patera Jersey for you. So I made a few calls. I talked to Scooter, uh, Scooter set him up and sent, I think he, he bought the Jersey from him. And so now he's sending me mine. Now. It, it takes a while to get here right now because our post office is so small. Um, and we're really backlogged from COVID and everyone's ordering, but yeah, so it's on its way. Wow, there you go. Uh, no, uh, on on my list first though, it was your you're up north where there is a lot to do outdoors. What's been kind of your your go to lately? Are you uh, are you a fisherman? Are you? I know you're out snowmobiling earlier. Is that kind of one of your main hobbies? Yeah, well, in the win- in the winter for sure, I love going sledding. Um, that, that's one of my biggest things. Obviously, hockey if we can. But with COVID, uh, my kids and I are on the ice quite a bit. Um, it's been minus thirty and minus forty without the wind here the last two weeks until this weekend. So we haven't been on the ice up till today. It had been almost three weeks, but we were on the ice steady almost every day during COVID uh, and, and getting on there for like 30 minutes, maybe an hour sometimes. But um, the weather hasn't been good. So uh, those are the things we've been doing lately. Uh, in the summer, I'm on the lake all the time, uh, whether it's wakeboarding or fishing. Um, I love doing those things. Those are These are all things that I picked up after playing hockey because I was always told that I shouldn't be doing those things. And um, now that I'm not, playing hockey i do those things so uh i I enjoy definitely being outdoors um hiking um you know it it, it's it's a really good area here we have where we're fortunate to have lakes that are so beautiful um very clear like second clearest in the world uh the one lake we spend a lot of time at is rocky lake and um we're there all the time and whether it's fishing or on the boat um we're enjoying the weather and what it's a great area to live in if you're an outdoors person. Uh, that reminds me, uh, you saying that you, you know, when you were playing, you probably shouldn't have been wakeboarding and doing all these other things. We had Scooter on a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about how he had to ask Crim's permission to go to Canada's <laughs> national baseball camp and <laughs> kind of hesitant but said okay go ahead and then scooter said three games into camp he got hurt and had to call crim and tell him he was coming back but he was injured and needed a doctor's appointment <laughs> uh, I, i'm surprised that he let him because i know my first year i tried i tried to play on the volleyball team with the crocus planes um i was really into volleyball uh through high school and middle school and um i was actually very good and so when a few of my friends from crocus said that 
come join the team. I was like, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> and then Krim found out and he's like, no, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, that was kibosh pretty fast by Krim, but, um, probably cause yeah, no. four years earlier, Scooter got hurt at baseball camp. That's probably all yeah, Scooter's fault. I'm going to, I'm going to blame Scooter on that one. Now, like now I know the full story. Why, why we weren't allowed <laughs> to do the extracurricular stuff. Uh, what was your uh, what was your original two week? You know when they way back a year ago and they said two weeks to flatten the curve and everyone hit the Netflix and the Amazon Prime. What were you and your wife watching and binge watching uh, in the early stages of COVID? Oh geez, um, I don't know actually. Uh, there's been so many series we've been watching. The latest one. Um, you know what? Tonight we just turned on something with the Vegas Knights, which is has been really good. We. We, uh, we haven't finished it, but it's not a series. We, we've, I think we've watched almost every series in Netflix and between Netflix Prime, I, probably The Mandalorian is the one I turned on, um, Disney Plus. So uh, I love that one. And it's, yeah. Um, and then another one would be, oh, yeah, I can't even remember. There's been so many. I'm it, with it, you. It's just, they it's, all run it's together. Honestly, it's, it's crazy. It's the amount, like, I'm not usually a big TV person, um, but you know, it's, it's something we do now. It's, it's just different, but we, we do still try to get outside as much as we can. Um, but you know, you're, you're pretty limited, especially when the weather's uh, pretty cold. Who is one weak King teammate that you remember looking up, looking at up the ice and just saying this guy's special. Oh, Kirby law. Um, I remember <laughs> I didn't think like, Oh, when they, when they brought him in and I saw him in camp, I'm like, that's Kirby Law. Who's Kirby Law? I, I didn't know who he was, um, and I didn't know many of the guys on the team. Obvi- obviously, like um, my background, just coming into, the, I just didn't know guys. Um, where a lot of kids nowadays, they know who, who they're up against and stuff like that. But Kirby Law came in, and I remember seeing him in camp, and he was he didn't look like much. But then he was like tough. He could score. He could hit. He could fight, and he like he was a good player and he's like from what i hear even in senior today like he's a really good player but he was one guy that like he not only stood out but he like he surprised me because i just you don't you don't look at you look at cory serin or stefan trinesky like you look at him like, holy like he looks like a player and, and kirby law he just he kind of just looked looked like he just came in and did his thing but he was an impact player yeah, you know, he, he, he was totally an impact player and you wouldn't expect some of those things out of him. And, you know, the, the guy could fight. He was he would stand up for anybody on our team, too. So uh, he's not a huge guy. And and the toughness he brought and his scoring ability was was unbelievable. He was a he was a Team Canada Spengler Cup legend. Uh, yeah. His time over in Europe. I mean, he was a he was one of those guys, I think, along with with Marty Murray, that had they played now. Um, they might have had a longer NHL career. For, um, for sure. You know everything. what? The the game today would totally suit so many guys from that team. Um, Andre Lupin, a great defenseman, ended up being a forward sometimes for us, but like gifted offensively, uh, built like a tank. Um, even a guy like Bobby Levins, who was traded to Spokane, made the speed he had. I'm not sure if you remember him, but like he was a crazy fast player. And, um, you know, like, yeah, for sure. In today's game, like some of those guys would excel a lot more now than they would have back then when there was a lot of clutch and grab and uh, it was a lot slower. <laughs> well, my last one for you, uh, I'm sure you're going to carefully select your answer, but if you were to say you had a favorite NHL team now or guys you cheer for, is it Vegas and why? <laughs> for, yeah, <laughs> I, I totally, like from day one when, when, uh, when Krim was there, Krager, um, you know, there's, the, it, it is Vegas. I cheer for Vegas all the time. They're not, I, I, I've always said I've never really had a favorite team. When I was drafted by the Caps, I had to say them. <laughs> and I, ironically, George McPhee is, is the, the GM there, but like he's him and Krim, they've done a great job. They've done, like I was just saying to my wife, they've done everything right for that, that program. Um, from their office staff to, to the players and bringing in the right guys and they've done a great job there and uh, they continue to. So like they're, they're an easy team to cheer for and to like, uh, and obviously with the whole Vegas thing, um, the shooting and stuff going down that year, it was a pretty emotional and for them to do what they did um, to bring the, 
a lot of community spirit to that 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 place. It's amazing the things they did. So, yeah, um, I love watching them play. I love Flurry. Um, he's one of my favorite goalies, along with Price. So, uh, I can easily cheer for Vegas. Somebody who wears gold pads is one of your favorites. <laughs> yeah, you who would have thought? Because I, I, I always like. I was like. I did it. I can't say I did it first, but I was like, I did it before him. And I always, yeah. I always give credit to Jody Lehman because even when he was in Moose Jaw, he was all red pads. And ironically, when I ended up in Portland, I had all red pads. So, um, yeah. So <laughs> I, I always look back at that and say like when, when Flurry had the all gold pads in, in world juniors and then brought him to, to Pittsburgh, he, uh, I always said like, you know what? I did that before him, but like not a lot of people would know that. So, <laughs> My there last one first for you, Joe Filipino Mark. Drafted. You first Filipino What's drafted that? and first guy to wear yellow pads. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. yeah. My last one for you, Joe Mar, is when you look back at your weekend career, is there one moment or one game that you just instantly kind of remember as the, like the moment? Yeah, there's a couple of them to be honest, but it's, it's mostly from my first year. And uh, the one, I think it was actually just in the paper, maybe a few days ago. Um, I think it was a game six win against the Calgary Hitmen in Calgary at the Saddle. It was the Saddle Dome at the time. Um, and it was in front of 17,000 fans. And that win clinched the series. Um, that was one, one of the biggest ones I've been a part of. Um, and, and in front of that many people, for sure. Um, uh, that, that one stands out. Um, but also, like, even every game in the final that year against Portland stands out to me. Just because of, you know, I was a year removed from that. Um, I, I didn't know where I was going to play. I was expecting to be in Notre Dame that year. I was, let alone being, you know, one of the top goalies uh, in the country to be drafted. Uh, and I was ranked. And, and that was all stuff that was foreign to me. And it was all new. Um, and the way I took it was that is I just I just tried to play and tried to not well that stuff but like it's really hard not to like you know you, you have guys saying like ah, I just don't think about it and they're thinking about it it's in the back of their minds but you do you try to put it aside and just just play like we're in, in minor hockey and, and that's what made me successful when I was in minor hockey and I could do that and carry that over into junior well you know but I would say uh, like team for sure and then most all the games, even we, though we lost in four straight, they had a great team. Um, we were out of gas, and um, though all the games, I, I honestly believe that the, the, the series in against Portland is actually what got me drafted. Like aside from my success through the year, but that series, even losing four, I I felt like I was really good in that series, uh, and. I, I thought that's what got me drafted to where I was drafted. Well, Joe Mar, this was awesome. I know the Weeking fans are going to love it. Every time we go down the kind of uh, historical avenue and talk to guys from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, uh, the fans uh, just love it. And hopefully uh, we can see another Cruz goaltender drafted by the Wheat Kings. What would that be, about 2029 maybe? Would be 16 years old for you? Yeah, he, so. yeah you know what? I... I, I'm not even going to do the math just because like I, I'm trying to get him to approach it like I do because I haven't even, he doesn't know what draft is he's the same as me right well, now like, for you. he doesn't watch he doesn't even watch hockey yeah so I'm, I'm trying to get him down that, that path so that he doesn't have to think about it and, um, but he does say he wants because he knows there's the weak things so um, I know I know he he makes the team on NHL 21 and whatever and he, he has himself as a weak thing already so um, he does want to play he knows he wants to play there so we'll see Uh, if he does he does if he doesn't that's fine yeah but it would be kind of neat all right joe mar we'll let you go this was awesome and uh well best of luck stay healthy up there and uh hopefully we can uh you know chris can coordinate uh, you guys coming down and, and watching a game whenever we're allowed to have fans again for sure it's been awesome thanks guys our thanks again to Joe Mar Cruz, one of the uh, all-time fan favorite Wee King goaltenders. Uh, Crow, we kind of mentioned before, uh, I know you have memories of Joe Mar playing. Uh, I, I don't. But after hearing him speak and after hearing the stories, I mean, he ranks right up there with, with my all-time favorites, even though I've never seen him play. 
I mean, all you have to do, for those of you that are listening to the pod and didn't get a chance to watch the clips of him fighting, I mean, you hate to glorify fighting, but I, I mean, I love a good scrap just as much as the next guy, especially a good goalie tilt. But I mean, he was such an electric player. I mean, you watch those those videos when he finishes the fight, you know, he spins around, he gives the raise the roof and he's hooting and holler and he spins his gloves. He's just, he was an entertainer. That's a good way to put it. Almost a little bit of that WWE flashy attitude, like, hey, I'm going to beat you up and I'm going to put on a show when I do it. And, uh, you know, it was great to hear his story about how he didn't know anything about the uh, Brandon Wheat Kings and the fact that he learned to fight from Vinny LeCavalier and Brad Richards at Notre Dame. I'd say that's uh, that's pretty good company to be roomed with at Notre Dame. So uh, Joe Mar uh, was gracious enough to do that. And, uh, you know, we, we wish him all the best and safety up north and as he gets uh, his gym and everything going uh, rack wise begin to open up and he can kind of get back to his regular life. So, um, Thanks for him. Uh, thanks to him for doing that. Uh, as always, uh, our interviews uh, and our entire show brought to you by Coors Light. But you wanted to touch well on one the thing, esports. Yeah. Well, one thing I liked him talking about too was the fact that when his kid plays NHL 21, he plays as the Brandon Wee Kicks, right? So uh, we're, that kind of led us into talking yeah, about esports. So uh, last week was supposed to talk about it. My bad. I, I had it written down, and just somehow we we got skipped. But the esports tournament it, it wrapped up, and want to say thank you to my IT source. Want to say thank you to Feastify, Brandon University, ACC. They all came on board for our first ever uh, esports tournament. We've never really done this before, and uh, we had a whole lot of fun. So congratulations to our two winners. There was a kid named Zigzag out of Winnipeg who won the 16 and under division. He's a 16 year old, and then uh, a guy named Brendan Back who goes by Back. He won the uh, the 17 plus division. And actually, just earlier today, he made the trip in from Winnipeg uh, to come and pick up his uh, his prizing, of which he won about. Four thousand dollars worth of prizes. So it was wow. uh, it was an awesome tournament. Yeah, his grand prize was a three thousand dollar custom PC that was uh, built a gaming PC from my IT source. So it was uh, it was fantastic uh, for a first time out. I want to thank those guys. It was actually pretty incredible the fact that we opened that up from coast to coast, and we had players uh, from Quebec, from Saskatchewan, Alberta. BC, uh, and, and uh, didn't have any Ontario, which was weird. We somehow skipped all that huge province when we got out in <laughs> Quebec. Um, but uh, people found the tournament, but we ended up having four Manitobans end up in the final four. And then uh, it was a guy from uh, uh, Brandon actually was in the final four as well. So it was well represented locally. We had a lot of fun and uh, talking to those guys, uh, there's actually a lot more going to be coming down with the BWK, uh, BWK Esports. And uh, they've actually become buddies now, the finalists. And they're talking about and we are talking, we're going to start putting together some uh, uh, some of the uh, EA SHL teams. So for those that are listening who know the video games, uh, there's some more stuff with the BWK Esports that are going to be coming down. So a lot of fun there. So thanks to, to everybody for taking part in that. And uh, that was only our first tournament. There's going to be a whole lot more coming up with that uh, now that we got the ball rolling. Well, good job uh, to you for <laughs> trying to get something going in a time where there wasn't a lot going on. And uh, that being said, tip of the cap to Remax and the province of Alberta today. This is something I hope that uh, they can do in the hub uh, in Regina to support uh, all of the teams, uh, including Brandon and Winnipeg, who aren't from Saskatchewan. But Albertans will now have a chance to support junior hockey, not just in the dub, but the AJHL, which just got approved to restart. That's, of course, the Junior A with a new 50-50 draw. Now, all the jackpots uh, that uh, are presented by REMAX are, are joint between the two leagues. So this is all approved through Alberta's Gaming, Liquor, and Lotteries uh, Commission. And what they're going to do is basically it'll run every weekend through the month of March. And uh, you can buy the tickets. It'll be running online. It'll be a running online tab 50-50. They'll make draws at the end of each weekend. Um, and people can win money, and the money that stays in the other half of the pot go to support the AJHL teams and the WHL teams. So a great way to combine the two leagues and the province's love for hockey. We've seen what the 50-50s have been at the World Juniors and at the Edmonton Oilers games. Uh, so uh, for those fans that we have in Alberta, I know Dan Block and a lot of our <laughs> friends, uh, players, parents, and friends, they're going to be buying 50-50 tickets, but hopefully uh, this province of Saskatchewan can do something like that as well. So 
Uh, that is a cool, cool initiative there. I do believe you have to be an Alberta resident to buy tickets. Yeah, though, yeah. So, so, so all that, like all that, all that stuff with the lotteries is always done provincially. So that's why you always have to be in the province. So there'll be no hopes of doing Saskatchewan, Manitoba one together. Um, it would have to be separate. Yeah, you have to, yeah, you're right. But, you're right. But, Sorry about but, that. but no, no, no. I mean, it'd be ideally. I mean, that would be fantastic. Um, I love the fact that Alberta, though, that it wasn't just the WHL teams. They included the Junior A. That's a really positive sign as well. Uh, fantastic news, just 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 for them to be trying to raise money there. Um, remember when Moose Jaw does their New Year's Eve game and they have, like, the I massive 50-50? You hate it because in the office, we all throw in, like, $20 each, and you have to go and buy hundreds of dollars worth of 50-50 tickets Man. for us that night. Um, I'm, I'm starting so... to think, Dan, uh, Dan, I know you're listening. Listen, I think we might have to just uh, start to e-transferring you 10, uh, 15 bucks here, and you can start uh, being our crow on the road because we're not going to be able to get out there uh, this year and do any of the traveling big 50-50s. But when there's a big 50-50 and crow, you're on the road, we love having you there because you're our go-to no, guy. I, I hate it. It's so bad because it, it starts simple. Dana, who uh, is no longer with The Week King, she's actually with Westman, the company that's, of course, producing the podcast. But um, she would always say to me, hey, if I give you a couple bucks, can you buy some 50-50 tickets? Couple bucks. It would always start small. <laughs> it would always start, start yeah. small. And by the time we rolled into Moose Jaw, I would have like $400 in my pocket. And Scooter would owe me about 100 on e-transfers from the coaching staff and the trainers. And then the, Dana had rules. I wasn't allowed to buy them all from one station. I had to buy one from a handheld. I had to buy one from over here. So here I am on game day, running around, I would do an interview with one coach, and then I'd run upstairs to the 50-50 counter, buy a couple <laughs> tickets. I'd go down, do another interview with the other coach, run around to the other 50-50 thing, grab it, and then at the media timeout in the first or second period, I'd call over the walking 50-50 guy to buy tickets, and I'd have them all laid out on the press box counter. I'd have to just write down the number off the scoreboard and then review it all after. And normally at this time, healthy scratches are involved, and they're giving me money because they're not old enough to buy tickets. <laughs> is probably my worst broadcast of the year because i'm not even remotely <laughs> you're so concerned about the 50 50 uh, and then dana wanted pictures of every ticket and oh my god i'm so glad that that's not happening this year because it was just a pain in my ass and we never won so it wasn't even worth it so, yet we haven't won yet crow yeah, yet we're going uh, to. speaking of money and <laughs> speaking of money and uh and supporting your hockey club uh there will be some news today which is tuesday the february 23rd the day that this podcast comes out yeah. regarding how fans can get involved in the hub but now i'll let you peel the curtain back on that one a little bit yeah okay so whl live so this podcast is coming out at noon on tuesday as of the recording of this which is just the night before it's monday night um so tuesday afternoon the league is supposed to be announcing to the public what the plans are for WHL Live. Uh, so this is, of course, the, the web streaming service. It's an all-new provider this year, so there's going to be uh, a whole lot of details that will be shared uh, by the league. But uh, for season ticket holders, check your email inbox because uh, by the time you hear this, you uh, you will have had an email, and it's got an exclusive offer for you. So for season ticket holders only, they get an exclusive offer for WHL Live. Um, and uh, But for everyone else, it's, it is extremely affordable it does not only include just your team but every game in the whl is included in this package uh it's it's going to be fantastic i encourage you to go check it out so by the time you hear this chances are it's it's already been made public so go and check it out at uh, the whl twitter their facebook but uh, whl live uh it's uh yeah i mean for for the price for like 60 bucks the fact that you can get the entire season worth of games um and they do have the day passes as well um it, it's it's well worth it but for season ticket holders make sure you go and check your email and if you didn't get an email and you're a season ticket holder from last year, just make sure you contact the Weeking office and send us an email and we'll make sure that uh, the offer is extended to you as well. But uh, that's going to be so like your way to get into the games this season, of yeah. course. Of course, I will have uh, my call actually goes on both. At, at, for people that don't know, when you're watching on the webcast, it's just it's my radio broadcast piped through the, the, the video. So that's why sometimes you'll hear at a whistle or something, you'll hear me talking and say, hey, I need, I need 30 seconds here, or hey, I, I got to run to the can. Usually, uh, people that are watching <laughs> sometimes, sometimes there's hear a those massive burp that gets let out. That's yeah, just, yeah, there's. Yeah. Sometimes there's some funny stuff. It's because uh, you're off air, out. but you're really not off air. I'm not really. And there's no button that I can push to turn me off of both when I still have to communicate back. So I am so pumped. Uh, we will have every game, half hour pregame shows, uh, live postgame shows from the Brand Center. 
uh, on both the WHL Live on Q Country 91.5 and on 880. And also, if you're sitting at home, you can tune in to WCG TV channel uh, zero. What is it? Twelve hundred now? Uh, I don't even know what it is. Uh, but uh, WCG public access. Uh, give it a click on game nights. You can have it on your TV through your speakers and uh, soundbar and whatever else. But uh, yeah, we're uh, we're excited to to bring you some more information this week, both off ice and on ice. Uh, next week, episode forty five, Darren Ritchie, a full training camp preview. We will have it for you right here on the Weekly Harvest. So uh, that's all I got for this week. Again, big thanks to Joe Cruz uh, for, for helping us out this week. I got something else written down here, but my handwriting is so terrible, Crow. I can't even make out what I wrote. Emails? No? What do you Emails. Got? That's what I wrote. Oh, my goodness. I thought I wrote down, it looks like a C. It's not even an E. I just chicken <laughs> scratch that. I should, I should have been a doctor, man. I'm telling you. Uh, in the email inbox this week, uh, there, there wasn't, a, wasn't a whole lot, So, uh, to be honest, which is absolutely fine. Um, but you know what was uh, what's, what's hilarious? It's uh, The email inbox gets the most play when, of course, we do these giveaways. And uh, what's our running time here? So we're not we're not crazy long this week, but uh, we're still gonna uh, you know help out those that have stuck it out here to the end. So uh, again, if you want to send us an email, it's qweeklyharvest at gmail.com. The letter Q Weekly Harvest at gmail.com. Uh, if you send us an email and you got a question for Darren Ritchie to get on next week's pod, we're gonna put uh, everybody's name uh, into a draw, and we are gonna have uh, an exclusive giveaway for an autographed eight by 10 week king print so everybody sends an email we'll uh, we'll get in for that uh, next week so qweeklyharvest at gmail.com chance to win a autographed week king print crow that's uh, that's all i got that's, for this week that sounds lovely i cannot wait for next week with darren ritchie uh he's already given for the me the third a few... time darren ritchie yeah. coming on for the third time i love it he's already given me uh you know some some uh some flack for Every time we get him on, the, the pressure is on. Usually it's not just him come on and, and shoot the breeze. He's usually got something to talk about seriously. So one of these days we're going to have to get him on like in the summertime where he's got his flip-flops and, and swim trunks on on the deck and he can just relax instead, instead of us grilling him about trade deadline or the bubble. He, he wants to have some fun. But, hey, he's a GM. He's got to ha- he's got to take care of business before we can have some fun. So that, looking that, forward to it. That's right. We definitely are. And uh, Crow, I noticed you're wearing on top of your head still your New York Ranger hat supporting oh, yeah. uh, Brain Schneider. Yeah. But uh, you got to get yourself into the city here because I'm holding up to the camera right now. I finally got my Billy's beef hat. So thank you to Billy Friday. for for bringing in the hats. It only took me ordering another hundred dollars worth of sausage for him to bring it in for me. <laughs> uh, oh man, that sausage! It's so good on the ice, Crow. It's like it's the best ice uh, fishing food I've ever had is Billy's. It's well, so we got to give him a free plug then. If you uh, if you want to support a local, uh, locally sourced uh, beef farm, uh, check out Billy's Beef Online and so social media. Of course, Mark Lego, his wife Jenna, and her brothers who both played in the Western League, Del Cowan and Nick Cowan. You remember them quite well. That whole family's doing a great thing with Billy's Beef. So check them out online. And uh, it pairs if, if so well with a Coors you. Light. It pairs so well okay. with a Coors Light. Yeah, it does. And if you tell them that we sent you, maybe we'll maybe we can get it upgraded to a T-shirt. So <laughs> there we go. You're shooting too big now, buddy. You're shooting. Oh yeah, I still haven't even seen my hat. So hey, well, uh, I'll take what I can get though. Until next time, Weekly Harvest, as always, brought to you by Coors Light. Enjoy the week and uh, enjoy the excitement as we build up to the hub. Until next week, have a good one. Cheers. Be sure to follow Q Country and the Wheat Kings on Twitter and Facebook for all your Brandon Wheat Kings news. Thanks for listening to the Weekly Harvest.